everyday gospel rhythms. And when I was going through my notes, I thought the story, because that's kind of where we left off. We left off that the part of the everyday rhythms is the story formed and how that we live inside a story. The story being the story that God wrote, right? We're story formed people. We're people who live in our families with our story, our life, who lives in our community, that lives in our state, so loud back there, please. in our culture. The story, we're story formed people. And the video clearly just laid out God's plan and how that he moved. And our story, our lives, are lived within that overarching story of God. We are the ones that have been told to go and proclaim. So as we're learning our story, we're seeing where that fits in. All right, now we want to listen. We look at Jesus, and Jesus listened to God in prayer. He made it a habit to go and spend time with his Father, and so he listened, and God revealed his will to his son, Jesus. Now we listen because through the gospel, through the message, we see that we can do nothing without him. That we have an ongoing need to have him in our lives and to understand him and what his plan is. Because if we're not listening to him, we're listening to somebody. Who are we listening to? Are we listening to the world? Right? Are we listening to Satan? Because in the garden he started causing a Eve to doubt what God said. In our video, Matt Papa says that he came to her and he said, did God really truly say that you weren't supposed to touch that fruit? Because the reason he told you not to, he must not want you to be happy. He must not want you to be free. See, God made us with a free will to choose to listen to him or to listen to our own selfish needs. Satan tries to tell us that. He tries to get us and confuse us, get us off track of what the gospel message really is and who we really are in Christ, our identity. Remember that who is God? What did he do? And because what he did, who am I in that? And because I know who I am and what he did for me, then that changes what I do. We want to remember who we are in Christ. We don't want to listen to the wrong voices. See, if we listen to the wrong voices, then we're going to find ourselves in the same position that Eve was. We're going to find ourselves being deceived. So it's important for us to know the gospel story, to know who we really are in Christ and what he did for us and who I am in God because of that. So that when the deceiver comes along, whosoever voice that is, whatever that is, we're not caught up and deceived in that message and then start believing a lie. We all listen to someone's voice. We have to decide what we're listening to. That's our choice. That's what we need to do. So in, I, if you've got your notes, Mark chapter 1. Let's turn to Mark chapter 1. And we're going to look at um, verses 35 through 37. Mark chapter 1. 35 through 37. Thirty-five says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, 
and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to a nearby village so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. He was listening to his father's voice. He spent time with him. And in John, let's flip over to John chapter 16. We're going to look at John chapter 16. Verses 7 through 15. Now, when we're listening, we're submitting to God through a constant backward and forward listening. So backward meaning that we're looking at the Gospels and we're learning the story. We're understanding what God has said, but we're also looking and listening forward to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. So in John chapter 16, verses 7 through 15, it says, But very truly I tell you, and it's in red, so Jesus must be speaking, right? Okay, so this is Jesus speaking. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Amen. Glory to God. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak of his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Did you catch that? Jesus heard what the Father said. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to us because he was going to remind us and show us the truth. And the things that he speaks, Jesus just said, are the things that I'm going to tell. Verse 15, all that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Forward listening, listening to what the Holy Spirit has to say. And then let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. If yours has little titles above it, mine says, God's final word is Son. So Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through him also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by, the power, by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Again, laying out that story, God spoke to his people, days of old, through prophets. Right? Laid out his plan, told them what they were supposed to be doing, where they were supposed to be going, why they were doing certain things. And then now, 
in these days he spoke to us through his son. And now even because Jesus went to be with him and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, the Holy Spirit, his spirit is here now to reveal, to lead, to guide, to open what is true. When the enemy comes along and says, did God really say? Truly, he must not have, because if he did, he wouldn't want, he doesn't want your freedom or your happiness. And when we hear that, then we can recognize and know if we're listening to the Holy Spirit, we're going to know. In that listening, we want to remember what are you believing about God? What are you believing about God when Satan comes along and tries to deceive you? Are you believing he's not strong enough? Are you believing he's not capable? Maybe he's not all-knowing. What are you believing? What lie are you listening to? Just like when God came to Adam and Eve in the garden, when he was looking for them, and, 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 and Adam says back to him, well, we were naked, I was afraid, and so we hid. And what did God say? Who told you? What lie? What lies are we believing? So when we're listening, we're listening to God, and the gospel story reminds us that we are fully dependent upon God's Spirit. We can do nothing without Him. We listen to the wrong voices. We get caught up in the wrong thing. Let's, in Acts chapter 1, verse, actually, in, in John we read that the, 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 the Spirit came for, to teach us truth, right? <coughs> Convict us of sin. Show us the way to go. And, and he came in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, to do what? To empower us, right? Acts chapter 1, Verse 8. As I was going through my notes last night, I kept remembering this, and I thought, yes, we need to talk about this. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We'll start verse 7. And he said, so Jesus is speaking, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That power, the Holy Spirit comes along and empowers us to do everything God wants us to do. To go. To be his witnesses. To share the good news. To share the story that God wrote from the beginning of time. So, we need to be walking in submission to the Spirit if we are going to live as God intends us to. And that brings me to, to Galatians. So if we flip over to Galatians chapter 5, you may know this scripture as the fruit of the Spirit, where Paul is laying out the differences between the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of our own nature, the fruit of the world, right? But in Galatians Chapter 5, verse six, 16 specifically, he says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And lays those things out there. They're totally in opposition to God and what he plans for us, what he wants for our lives. If we walk in the Spirit, He is the one who is going to enable us. He's going to give us the power not to gratify those things in the flesh, those things that oppose God, those things that are against Him. So we want to listen to God. The Holy Spirit is God. And we've already laid the Scripture, we've laid the argument that Father speaks to Jesus, 
the Son. And the Son speaks to the Holy Spirit, and he's only going to say what the, the Son says. So we want to listen to him. We want to pay attention because he's here. When you, when you study out the Holy Spirit, he's, he's our comforter. He's our paraclete. He's the one who is right alongside of us. He has all wisdom and knowledge because he's from the Father. His IQ is immeasurable because he knows everything. Right? Let's listen to him. What, what a great thing to have the Holy Spirit here with us when we have to make a decision and lead us what we need to do. I mean, my goodness. Why wouldn't you want to use that? All of us are quick to flip out our phone, right? Get Google and search it, right? Knowledge. We have the all-knowing being, third person of the Godhead in us. Way better than Google. Way better than Google. Okay, so we're listening to God. We're paying attention to his story and where we should go and what we should do. Now we need to listen to ourselves because that's where we get hung up. That's where I get hung up. Right? Pay attention to what you say to yourself. What are you telling yourself? C.J. Mahaney states in a book, his book, Living the Cross-Centered Life, that when we're listening to ourselves, we should be speaking the gospel to ourselves. When something comes along and it doesn't sound quite right, you should say, so who's telling me this? Is it contrary to God's word? Well, if it is, then, you know, tell it someplace else saying, I am not going to listen to that lie. I am not going to fall to that. I'm reminded of, of something, and I'm not telling myself, right? We have to be transparent. We have to be real. A couple years ago, when I took the position that I'm in now, and working from home, have a computer, right? It's summer, it's hot, I'm drinking water, I have it sitting on my desk, and it spills and it hits my, uh, my keyboard. So I pick it up quick, not much went on there, and I shook it out, and, and it continued to work, right? <sighs> and then a couple days later, it stopped working. And I could not for the life of me. And I thought, okay, now what am I going to do? Well, I told my boss, because he was a new boss. It wasn't one I had been working, didn't know this person as well. And so I, I told him that my keyboard quit working. I was like on a Friday or something, right? And so I was going to have to, we, they were going to replace it. And I said to him, you know, it's like, okay, okay, well, we'll just put an order and we'll get one, no problem, right? Went out to go buy it and, and replaced it. And all weekend long, that just stirred inside of me. Because I knew that the reason it really quit working, not because it was worn out, but because it, water had gotten on it and corrupted it. And so Monday, I had to confess to him. Okay, and he knows that I'm a pastor's wife. He knows who I am and all these good things, right? And I have to tell him that, well, you know, really, the reason it quit working is because spilled water on it, and I shook it out, and it was working just fine, and it dried out, but then it started not to work. And so I'll pay for it because it's my fault, right? And he says, well, Tina, why did you do that? It was no big deal. Everybody deserves to be well hydrated while they're working. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, Randy, thanks. <laughs> you know, but it bugged me and bugged me and bugged me. Now, why did I not want to tell him the truth? Because I was afraid. Because I was afraid of how he would react and what would happen. And, and I was willing to go replace it anyway. You know, so I should have just, rather than tell him the other thing. And so the lesson is, what was I listening to? And what was I believing? Did I believe that God put me in that position? Did I think that, that there was something, you know, that I had to be something better than what I was or whatever? I don't know what it was. I was not listening. Should have told him immediately, but I didn't. What are you listening to? I wasn't speaking the gospel to myself, obviously, because I told a lie. I went that direction. 
But the Holy Spirit came alongside of me, put me back, reminded me of who I really was and what I needed to do. What are you listening to? What are you telling yourself? We need to remind ourselves of what the gospel says regularly, listening to the truth. And weigh everything that we're saying to ourselves in light of the gospel. We need to ask the Spirit, where is my self-talk out of line with the truth of the gospel? Where is it not lining up? So then we need to listen to each other. Right? We're a family. We're a family of believers who love God and are serving Him. So we need to listen to each other. And I, I had drawn out last week the picture of a tree. And I had reminded and said that Pastor Bob and I had gone through this exercise ourselves. First I did it to him, right? And then he reminded me. <laughs> so we do this. We were listening to what each other was saying. What are you believing? The fruit that we're supposed to have is the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, right? All those things that are listed in Galatians chapter 5. It would be verses 22 down. So, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So the thought is when you start asking, asking those questions, what am I believing about God? Who is God? So what am I believing about him? This, this anxiousness, this anger, this uh, malice, right? What are those things? What am I believing about God? What am I believing about what he did For me. What did he do for me? He loved us so much that he sent his son for us and he searches for us. He doesn't expect us to find him on his own. He searched for us. He came from heaven to find us. He walked in the garden because he wanted fellowship with his creation. He wanted fellowship with his son and his daughter. And he looked for them. And he says, where are you? Adam, where are you? Jesus told the story about the woman who lo loses a coin and, and goes out and tells all her friends. You know, she searches and she sweeps and she sweeps and she finds it. And she rejoices and runs out and says, I have lost my coin and I found it. Jesus told the story about the hundred, the ninety-nine and one, right? The sheep. Right? And that the shepherd, when he realizes that one of his little sheep, his lambs, is missing, what does he do? He leaves the ninety-nine to go find the one that's lost. Father God searches for us to find us. That's what he did for me and you. Right? Now because of that, that should change everything. That should change what we're thinking, what we're doing. It changes who we are because now we belong to him. Okay? So what are you believing? And what are your friends believing, your brothers and sisters, when we're, when we're having a conversation? Ask them, you know, how does what you're feeling and what you're experiencing measure up with the gospel? Let's talk about this. You know, 
know, what are you believing? What's the enemy trying to deceive you with? Don't be afraid to do it. Because as you're going down that path, the same Holy Spirit that's in you is in them. And he's going to remind them, yeah, remember? This is what Jesus did for you. Remember? That's not who you are. You're no longer that person anymore. The Holy Spirit will remind you. And then, knowing that God searched for us. God is, was a missionary for us. He came out into the world to find us. We, in turn, what did Jesus say before he went up in Matthew chapter 28? Go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them everything that I taught you to do, making disciples. Well, those apostles that he sent out did that. And they made churches and gatherings and families. And they went out, and they went out, and they went out, and they went out. They came across in boats, right? And they landed here in America. And they told, they told the story. And that's what we're supposed to do. It didn't stop with us. Now we're in America, now we make all these little churches with steeples and everything like that. That's not where it stops. We are still the same people, the same command that Jesus gave those apostles. It's the same command that he gives us. Go into all the world. So now we're in the community. What we listen to. What is their story? What are they telling us? What are they believing? If you're here in Madison, you know, the, the, uh, the foundation, the uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation was established here in Madison, in Day County. What are they believing? Not God. So what does that affect? How is that affecting the community around us? What's the community believing? Because that freedom from religion is here. What is the UW teaching? What is our public schools teaching? What are the radio waves teaching? What are we believing? What is our community believing? And so we have the opportunity to stand with them and share with them the good news, the gospel, and say, you know, this is what God says. This is what God did. This is what my father did for me. And you share the story. There are so many opportunities that each one of us would run up, in, uh, up against that is presented to us every single day to share the gospel. And if you know the story well, if you know the story, you have the opportunity to share that story. This is what God did for me. Proclaim it. Share it in your culture, in your community, every place that you're at, your workplaces. Do not be afraid. In your workplaces, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. That, that is what keeps us from sharing. That is what keeps us from doing certain things because we're afraid of what people are going to think. What are they going to say? What are they going to do? Well, that's just the enemy trying to keep you from sharing the good news, the gospel, the fact that what God did for each and every one of us, not just us here in these four walls, but every single person on the face of this earth, God did that. He wanted to redeem us. And that story, even if you just set this out, Was God. Then there was the fall. Then 
there was Jesus. Faith, right? God and there was sin that he provided redemption and because of that redemption restoration simple because of sin in our lives we're already condemned to hell that's it end of story but that's not what he wanted for us that was never his intention so he wrote the plan. He started the story. He did the redemption story to restore us back into fellowship. So what is our community believing? They're believing a lie. They're believing the lie that Satan started in the Garden of Eden. Because the reason why God told her not to eat that fruit was because, obviously, he didn't want her full happiness and freedom. We are truly free in Christ. We are no longer bound to the law of sin and death. We've been set free. So we learn the story. We listen to what the scriptures have said and to what the Holy Spirit is telling us. And the next step in a gospel rhythm, everyday rhythms, is to celebrate. That's what we're doing here today. We come together to celebrate. I am not forgotten, right? I am not forgotten, right? Every praise, some of the songs that we sing, we have to remember why we're really singing them. It's not just words on a page or notes that are written on a, a treble clef and a bass clef. It's not just expertise, you know, and all those things. These are messages to come together to celebrate God's extravagant blessing in Jesus Christ. His extravagant, like he lavished his love. Love, his, he lavished it out on us, like poured it out. He didn't waste anything. In the gospel, there was the example of the woman with the alabaster box, right? Before Jesus was going to be crucified, she came in and she took this alabaster box. And you remember what they said to her? Why didn't you sell this and give this money to the poor? She broke it and anointed him and poured it out over him. That is the same kind of extravagance, that extravagant love that he lavished on us. How amazing that is. And so we celebrate that goodness. Every single thing that we do should celebrate his goodness, his blessings. When we have communion, that's celebrating what he did for us. When we gather together in our life groups, when we get together in our little communities and we break bread together, simply share a meal, you know what we're doing? We're celebrating that God is my provider. That he provides everything that I need. He provides a roof over my head and he provides food for my belly and clothes for my back. He provides everything. That's a celebration of what his blessings are for us, of his grace and his mercy. In Leviticus chapter 23, and we're not going to read all of it, but in Leviticus chapter 23, it lays out, gosh, some amazing things, and that if you take the time just to, to read it, I'm just going to kind of go there really quick. I'm not going to read the whole thing because for the sake of time. But Leviticus chapter 23 lays out 
speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are our appointed festivals. God laid out the different feasts to come together, these festivals, not just to remind them, it was to remind them of what he was doing, what he was going to do, but it was also to celebrate his goodness. Leviticus chapter 23. And then in Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47, what did the, 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 the believers do at that point? I'll read that as a little bit shorter. So Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47 says this. Almost there. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to, one, to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God, and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They gathered together daily to celebrate the goodness, to make sure that everybody was doing okay. Do you need something? You know, I've got this. Can I share this with you? They met together to celebrate. And in Hebrews chapter 10, it tells us, Paul says, do not forsake assembling together. Why would that be? Because we need ourselves. Because when we're listening to the story and everybody's saying the things that they've been going through, we can encourage one another and remind ourselves, okay, what are you believing? Who's telling you that lie? What does God say about who you are? Because if we're all by ourselves, and we're not fellowshipping, guess what happens? We're going to listen to somebody's voice. We're going to feel bad. And I know, because I do it. I think this thing, this thought comes in, and then all of a sudden that spiral. How many of you ever been on that spiral? Well, if this, then this. And if that, then of course this. And and before long, I'm down here laying on the floor and I'm sobbing, right? Oh my gosh, I am this. But if we're together, we can encourage other, each other with hymns and songs, right? With scripture. You are not that person. Don't listen to that lie. Tell the devil to get out of here and peddle his junk someplace else because you're not going to buy it today. Amen. I'm not going to listen to it. Gathering together to celebrate on a regular basis. And I, I, I'm even meaning more than just Sunday morning, okay? It's important to get together. I don't care how tired you are. Fall asleep on my couch, okay? Gather together. you got to eat sometime. Let's eat together once a week. Let's fellowship. Let's talk. You know, and, I, and I'm the worst. I don't always call anybody. I'll text maybe once in a while, right? But we need to communicate. We need to, I need to get better at that. I don't know about anybody else. I'm pointing the finger at me, okay? I need to get better at communicating with one another. How you doing, Angel? Are you okay? Do you need anything? Right? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> right? Glenda, are you sure you're okay? Right? Gail, my sister. Diamond, right? All of us, we need to do that. I'm telling you, I need that. I need it. Because I'm the pastor's wife, and I need it too. I am not an island. I need fellowship. 
because I'm stuck in the house all week long. I don't even get out. This, I don't even get out to go to an office. You know, there I am. Got people on the phone, but I don't have that fellowship. Right? We need each other. That's the way God intended it. So celebrating, celebrating God's grace and His goodness, speaking the gospel to each of us as we're going along and we're reminding ourselves. And we celebrate in our lives. Celebrate what God has done for me. What has he provided? And we get to say, yay, go God! You know? We can celebrate with you. And now you know what that does? Well, if he did it for Glenda, he's certainly going to do it for me. Right? If he did it for Jason and Randy, my God, he can do it for me too. What's God doing in your life and sharing that? So how often are we gathering together to celebrate? Not often enough. We think about our families, you know? What did we do when we were growing up in our families? We met every single day with our mom and our dad and our brothers and sisters and we ate. You know, we, we did things together, we went places, we celebrated, we enjoyed birthdays and, and holidays and all sorts of different things like that. They met, our family met all the time. It was big, a big party, right? I only had a sister, but there were 17 in Levitch's family. <laughs> right? Can you imagine? They're sick and get six in Bob's family, and when we get together, oh my God, Grandma's house is just overflowing. Right? But it's always busy and happy, and people are laughing and sharing. And what more reason do we have to get to go together and celebrate his goodness? And then, in the midst of our lives, comes this point of blessing. Blessing each other intentionally. Okay? Blessing each other uh, with words and gifts or actions. Right? Everything that we have has been provided to us by God. Not to store up our treasures here, but to give to him to be used, to bless, to bless, because that's what he does for us. He blesses us, and because he blesses me, I want to bless you. Because he has done this for me, I'm going to do this for you. And whatever it is, we saw it in Acts chapter 2, right? Towards the end that they met together, they sold everything and had it in common, and they provided for one another as they needed Right? You go through Acts and you see a couple different times where they took up offerings to share with the widows and take care of them. You know, actually, that's what was that's how God intended it. He didn't intend Social Security or disability. I mean, that's how God, really, honestly. He laid it out in the Old Testament, right? If, you, if you're supposed to take care of your family. I mean, it seems strange, you know, if, you're, if your husband dies, his brother's supposed to marry you and take care of you, right? Okay, God. But it was because he knew that they needed to be taken care of. He wanted to lay that out, right? He laid it out for them. And, and even if you look at the wonderful story of, of Ruth and Naomi, you know, and Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, picture of Jesus Christ for us, right? It was laid out for a purpose to remind us that we're supposed to take care of one another. And because, get this, Jesus tells us that because of our love one for another, they will what? They will know that we are his disciples. But that's even more. That's to give them a reason. Like, why are you taking care of angels that way? Why are you looking after Glenda in that manner? Well, because God loved me. He took care of me. He provided for me. You give an answer 
you can give an answer, a gospel message, and the reason why you're doing what you're doing. You know, you're walking along the street and the Holy Spirit says, give that person 20 bucks. Give that person 100 bucks. You should do it. And then you don't just stop there. You say, Jesus told me to give this to you. Well, why are you giving that to me? Because he gave me salvation. He provided for me. Paid the price and the penalty for my sin. That I could be restored. So I'm giving this to you. Bless our community intentionally and on purpose for a reason. Not just to give a, you know, a good thing. Not just to do a good thing. Act of service, right? Those are all nice and good, but there's a reason for it. We need to believe the gospel, the message, the story of God. We're not just blessed to be blessed for our own good. We've been giving it to bless others. And when we believe the gospel, when we believe that we don't have what we have just because, we have it because of Jesus, because he chose to bless us, then we really don't own it anyway. It's not really mine. It's not mine. And if I take care of somebody else, God's going to take care of me. He's going to supply everything I need. No fear. He's got it under control. So things that we've been saying that we can do. We celebrate here on Sunday mornings. We get together and in our life groups to support one another. We fellowship outside of those things. We eat together, right? We celebrate birthdays. <laughs> we celebrate. Celebrate each other. Eat regularly. Let me encourage you. Don't be so busy in everything that you do that you don't meet together. Get involved in one of the life groups. There's always an extra room. There's always an extra seat at my house. I've got lawn chairs. I've got dining room tables. I've got the floor. I've got a piano bench. There's always room. Don't be so busy that you can't come to see one another. And I know. I get tired too. Don't do it. Don't let that keep you from fellowshipping. We need each other. So today... We're closing. I want you to think about what the Holy Spirit has been saying to you. Because even though I've been speaking, I know that the Holy Spirit is saying things to you as well. What's he telling you? Where are you supposed to be speaking the story of God? Where are you supposed to be sharing what God has done?
Well, Jesus said, I'm his, his child. He forgave him my sins. I don't have to be angry. I can cast that away. You know, my identity is in Christ Jesus. It's not my own identity. Who are you? And then, then of course, the, then, well, for us, what's happened to us when we have kind of kind of role play there is that then the joy comes back. And the silliness of thinking, well, why did I get angry about that? Or why did I get upset? Or why did fear come on me? Because I was believing, I was believing a lie for that moment. And so we want to uh, do that. I want to 